Hey there, it's Jason from Codemanship uh, with a post-Christmas uh, video diary entry today. Uh, before we get into it, if you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe to our channel and ring the bell for notifications. Okay, so a thought has been rattling around in my head this morning. I've been trying to relax, um, but I just can't put it aside. Um, I've seen quite a few posts on LinkedIn and Twitter about um, people debating whether they should do um, classic test-driven development, like um, as described in Kent Beck's book, Test-Driven Development by Example, or the London School of Test-Driven Development. Now, classic test-driven development, sometimes it's referred to as the Chicago style or the Detroit style. Um, but to sort of distinguish between these, these two um, approaches, um, the, the, the classic style of TDD has a much greater emphasis on discovering or allowing the internal design of your code to emerge through the process of refactoring. So it's, it's this process where you sort of start test driving the entry point to your logic, and as you add more and more test cases and your code does more and more, you start to break it down. So methods that are doing too many things, you break them into multiple methods. And then classes that have too many responsibilities, you break them up into multiple classes. You're removing duplication, introducing more modularity as you go. So that sort of modular design, that internal structure, emerges mostly through that process of refactoring. Um, the, the London School of Test Driven Development um, is, um, it starts in the same way. It starts at the entry point to your logic. Um, it usually starts with customer tests in the same way that, that the classic style of TDD would. Um, and um, but there is much more of an emphasis on the interactions between sort of key interfaces or key objects in your design. So there's my, kind of more of an emphasis on messages, basically. Um, and that's why uh, mock objects uh, were invented, this technique for testing interactions between objects. Um, and that's why the London School is sometimes also referred to as the, the mockest school of test driven development. Um, and um, the debate ranges rages on many, many years later. I just can't believe we're still discussing this, um, about whether you should do it this way in the classic style or whether you should do it this way in the, the London style. The, the main sort of uh, criticisms that are levelled at the London School of Test Driven Development are, number one, the use of mock objects, mocks and stubs. I think they people often use those names interchangeably. So let's just talk more generally about test doubles. Use of test doubles, mocks and stubs, um, tends to unencapsulate the internal design, the internal structure of your code, because you're writing tests about whether that object called a method on that object, for example. Um, so if you try to refactor the internal structure, you can get into a situation where refactoring the internal structure of your code is much harder because so much of it is kind of um, exposed in the tests. Now, talking of unencapsulation, the classic style of TDD has a similar problem, which is that because testing is not so much about interactions, but about the effect of actions on objects, in other words, changes in state of objects, then we're unencapsulating, unencapsulating in a different way. We're, we're, we're revealing the internal state of objects. So they both kind of have disadvantages in that kind of way. Certainly, I have seen many teams who have over relied on mock objects um, and uh, stubs as well, who've ended up in a situation where their, it's their test code essentially bakes in the internal design, making it very difficult to refactor it. Um, but I just wanted to make a, a couple of points in this video. First of all, um, normally, well, almost always, when I see that problem arising, it's not because they're using mocks per se, or stubs. <laughs> it's not because they're using them per se. It's because there's a problem with their internal architecture. And to illustrate this, I'm going to show you. So here's, here's my implementation of the Guitar Shack. Um, which I've been spending a lot of time with recently. And this has been um, test driven in what we would recognize as the London style of TDD, in the sense that working from customer tests from the outside in, so starting at the entry point to the logic, in this case, a class called the stock monitor. Um, and in our stock monitor, you can see that it has a number of dependencies. And these are not products of refactoring. Um, these were planned dependencies. I, I sat down and I did a little sequence diagram and I thought, okay, I think this is how we're going to pass this test. Um, now, this, this is often something that is identified with this London style, that there is some upfront high-level design in the sense that we figure out those key roles and responsibilities, and in particular, the interactions between those roles. Um, but this would be a lie. And this is not true. Um, anyone who's familiar with extreme programming and read the original books in extreme programming will have seen um, 
techniques for upfront planning or modeling of design, like class responsibility collaboration cards, which essentially are, are uh, capture the same information as a sequence diagram. These are the main um, objects doing the work. These are their responsibilities. And these are the messages. These are the collaborations they're, they're having with each other. So it's a similar kind of thing to a sequence diagram. And if you've read the extreme programming books from the late 90s and early noughties, you will have seen UML diagrams, sequence diagrams, CRC cards, and all those kind of techniques. No one seriously has ever said, classic school or London school, that there's no point in thinking about the design up front. Just don't go into too much detail. There's a point at which really code is good at detail. So once you get down to the level of, well, should that be a public or private um, field? At that point, maybe you should just be writing code. Um, so planning the design and, and think, thinking about those key roles, responsibilities, and collaborations has always been a part of it, always been a part of this design process. Um, it's just that a, a, a different emphasis in how, about, how you go about implementing that design. So I've done my guitar shack in the London style. Um, I started at the entry points by logic. Let's go take a look at our stuck one to test, if you'd be so kind, IntelliJ. Um, and you'll see that its dependencies aren't real. We've got a mock object for this alert interface for sending alerts. Um, we've got um, a stub here. Uh, this is essentially an anonymous inner class, an anonymous implementation of this reorder level interface that returns a reorder level for that product of 10. Um, and we have a stub warehouse as well for that interface. So when we need a product for that particular product ID, um, then our stub warehouse will just return our test product <clears throat> so that we can test whether or not an alert was sent. So that's a use of a mock object then. Okay, and the reason that we've done it this way is so that we can solve one problem at a time. How are we actually sending the alerts? I don't know. We don't need to think about that yet. That's what I call somebody else's problem. Um, how are we actually calculating that reorder level for that product? I don't know, but we need a number. We need a number. Um, how are we actually fetching the product information from the warehouse? Don't know. We will cross that bridge when we get to it. So the big advantage of this approach is it scales beautifully because you, it allows you to solve one problem at a time. Um, but that's, again, not to say that we don't see that in the classic style of TDD as well. Um, fake it until you make it. We see a lot of that. Maybe uh, implemented in different ways. They may not be using mock objects frameworks, but very often you will see objects that are used in a test that are not the real thing. They implement a certain interface or they look the same from the outside. So there's really not much difference there. Again, as I said, it's just a question of em emphasis. And the idea with the London School is once we get our stop monitor working, the entry point to our logic, we start working our way down to implementations of these dependencies. So how are we calculating the reorder level? For, for that, we need to know how much of that product we sell every day um, over the last 30 days or however long we choose to look. And again, it's, it's sort of turtles all the way down. We're going to use a stub to pretend to calculate that number for us, but it's just going to give us a hard-coded test number. Um, and you'll see there it's injected in, so dependency injection everywhere, um, which is just good object-oriented design. It's got nothing to do with London school or classic school or whatever, um, so that we can, we can check that we're actually calculating the reorder level correctly. Um, and again, we drill down and say, but how are we actually calculating that rate of sales? So we move down the core stack, we move our way inwards and say, okay, but we need to know how much of that product we sold in the last 30 days. How are we getting that number? I don't know. That's somebody else's problem. It's got nothing to do with how we calculate the rate of sales. So we are upfront thinking about this separation of concerns and building that into our design process. And we're using stubs and mocks essentially to, to allow us to fake it until we make it so that we can get to that sub part of the solution at some point while we get this part of the solution working. And we're working our way down. And very interestingly, what we're doing here is we're defining key contracts within our design as we move downwards. So it's very contract driven. I've seen, seen that word coming up a lot of, as well in LinkedIn discussions, contract driven development. We're defining the contracts first and then getting to their implementations later. So we're looking at the client side of the equation first, and then we get to the supplier next. Um, and so we keep working our way down. So uh, we need sales data. We've got a unit test for that, and we've got a contract test uh, somewhere, and we've got our, our test for actually calculating the sales data and so on and so forth based on a particular um, date. 
um, that we're making our sale. So we work our way all to the all the way to the back until eventually we're actually connecting to the web and, and that becomes a, an integration test or in this case what we call a contract test where we're actually doing that calc um, getting that number but we're getting it from a real external endpoint from a real web service so we work our way all the way to the to the back of the architecture if you like to the other side if you think of hexagonal architecture we enter in one point we work our way all the way through and then we got finally got tests that are just at the edge we've got some some tests that actually are connecting to web services and these are what people would often refer to as real unit tests in the sense that, that we're really only testing one object and its dependencies for the most part are fake. It's not always the case in these, but for the most part are fake. Now, this has advantages and it has disadvantages as well. Um, it's not very good at spotting integration problems. Um, as very ably, very clearly described in his book, um, Object-Oriented Software Construction, Bertram Mayer, um, makes a very good point, which is it's not enough that we make sure that all of our components work correctly in our system. They've got to talk to each other correctly as well. Um, so at some point, you do have to test both sides of a conversation. Um, so what I would normally do once we've got all the pieces working is we'd write one big, in this case, one big integration test that is mostly implementations. And this is normally where people start to get a little concerned because they look at the setup for this test and they say, God, Jason, there are so many dependencies. Stock Monitor has so many dependencies. Well, does it? Because the, the indentation here is intended to give you a bit of a clue. In actual fact, the Stock Monitor only has three dependencies, and I think that's pushing it. But it doesn't have all of these dependencies. In actual fact, it only knows about the alert interface, the warehouse interface, and the uh, the reorder level interface. That's all it knows about. It doesn't know about their implementations. And very importantly, it doesn't know about its dependencies, dependencies. And its dependencies, dependencies, don't know about their dependencies, dependencies. Uh, we have true separation of concerns here. It's like Rush, what I call Russian dolls architecture. We've got objects being passed into objects, being passed into objects, being passed into objects. Each of the objects in the core stack, as we construct it, is only binding to its nearest neighbors, to those interfaces. So when we actually look at the unit test, you can see the setups are really small. Stock monitor does not have lots and lots of dependencies. Reorder level does not have lots and lots of dependencies. It just has one. Um, and so when you end up with a design that is very highly modular, has very clean separation of concerns like this, then using stubs and mocks is really not gonna hurt you very much. In fact, it's a great way to get to this kind of test code. So when we change the internal design, there's only a small part of the test code that's actually affected because there's only a small number of tests that actually know about that part of the internal design. The rest of the internal design is hidden behind those interfaces. Um, so yes, for sure, I've seen many teams struggling with mock objects, and that's because their designs are not very modular. They have big modules that do too many things and are very tightly coupled to lots of different dependencies. So I've seen tests where there's 50 lines of, of setup code for all of their mocks, which number one, runs really slow, um, but number two, yeah, if you wanted to refactor that internal design, you're gonna have to keep rewriting that test code. So if all of your tests look like this, with these kinds of big setups, then yeah, you've got a problem, particularly if all of that is being mocked. And big giveaways is when you're mo you've got stubs that return stubs that <laughs> return stubs. That's usually a big giveaway that you have got major dependency problems. Um, in, in that case, you're, 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 you're breaking a very fundamental rule of object-oriented design, which is objects should only interact with their immediate neighbors. Uh, and they should have as few immediate neighbors as possible. <laughs> So I've seen people like Steve Freeman, Nat Price, who wrote the book Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests, which is an exemplar of this particular style of TDD. I've seen them be very successful to come up with very clean architectures, to come up with great fast running tests that are only coupled to small bits of the design. They're only seeing small pieces of the jigsaw. So you can change the rest of the jigsaw without having to affect those tests. Um, so it works very well if you do it well. I also wanted to make another point. Stubs and mocks are used in that classic style of TDD. You'll see it all the time. Fake it till you make it, for example, or working with external dependencies like web services uh, and databases, you do see them used, maybe not to the same extent, uh, 
um, but you do see them used. And I think it really is just a question of emphasis. How much of your internal design is a product of refactoring? How much of your internal design is a, is a product of upfront design and stubbing and mocking, for example? And usually, as with many of these things, the truth is somewhere in between. Well-rounded test-driven developers need a bit of both. It's, a, it's like golf. You can't just be good at driving or good at putting. You have to be pretty good at both um, to get, get around a golf course um, in any sort of reasonable amount of time. Um, and TDD is kind of the same. And I, I do worry when developers say it's one or the other, because the reality is I've never been able to do real software without doing both. Um, and there's some degree of both. Now, I maybe have a lower tolerance for mock objects in particular than, than people like Steve and Nat. Um, but that's um, mainly because I'm sort of coming it from that classic style. Um, and it really is more of a direction that you're coming from. Where are the design decisions being made? Are they being made up front and you're thinking about those interfaces and those interactions? Or are they being made after the fact? Let's find out a detail. It's something in our design that happened after the fact that I can find here. Yes, this request builder, the thing, the thing that builds web requests. This was a product of refactoring. I don't, I don't believe it's actually used in any of the tests and there are no tests for it. It is tested. If I break it and run my tests, some of my tests will fail. Um, because it was a product of test-driven development, but as a class in its own right, it does not have its own unit tests and that are dedicated to this particular class. Maybe it should. Um, and we'll find as we go through that there are many little details in our design. Um, let's maybe take a look in our stock monitor, for example. Um, so, you know, helper methods, helper classes, etc., that emerge through the process of refactoring. So it's actually kind of a bit of both. It's, it's driving and putting. If we, if we think of driving as upfront design and thinking about planning those key interfaces and interactions, and we think of refactoring as putting to get the ball in the hole at the end, um, there's, there's an element of both going on here. And typically in real world designs that are much more complex than this, what you will tend to find is, uh, as a result of that, that London style, that mockist style, is that you will have key interfaces and key roles, responsibilities, key collaborations. And behind that will sit, will sit you know, a bunch of internal details, private methods, private classes, et cetera, et cetera, that are a product of internal refactoring as the code grows and emerges. The stuff we didn't think of basically in our design, the detail. Refactoring is really great at detail. Um, so I just want to make this point on the, the 28th of December, or is it the 29th today? What is the date? It's the 28th. Okay, I planned that well. Um, it's not London school or classic school. It's London school and the classic school. And I don't know anyone who's genuinely good at TDD, who's genuinely successful with it, who's not doing some of both to some extent. So hope that's been of some help, maybe cleared up some misunderstandings, or maybe it's just made you even angrier. If you're shaking your fist going, no, it's got to be London school, no, it's got to be classic school. Um, there is no war, the war is over. Um, just do what makes sense for that particular test and for your particular situation.